All right, welcome to the Data Center Hawk podcast. I'm Mike Netzer, joined as always by David Liggett. Today is a special podcast. I'm very excited for this. This is listener Q&A. So again, we track, again, people who comment below or comment on social, LinkedIn, et cetera, or just email or questions we get when we're on the phone with people. Uh, we've compiled them here. We're going to answer them next. Okay, so today is going to be a fun day. We're going to answer some questions we've got from Q and A. Q and A, yes, from people across all of our platforms. That's right. It's you know, so Rhett, people Rhett pulled these from every you know different YouTube, LinkedIn, yes. etc. Questions that people have asked us, Data Center Hawk, you know, through our different platforms and just questions that people have on industry. I think this is great. So you if can, you, so if people have a question, what have, can they do to ask? They may comment anywhere yeah. that you see Data Center yeah. Hawk. I think Rhett, most of these, yeah. We have taking, our best men on it. Yeah, we're taking from YouTube. But if, yeah, if you have questions, let us know and we'll do our best to put them in our Q&A sessions, which you are about to enter into. Yeah. <laughs> but again, I think this is, this is great because it really is, I'll call it voice of the customer. I know that's kind of a generic term, but it really is questions that real people have. Okay, so first one. Yes. Hey, it says, I'm wondering if you guys could discuss floating data centers and their pros and cons. Yeah. So uh, most data centers are built on land, <laughs> but we are. Uh, Thank you, Captain Obvious. The, yes, but there's been you know some different um, approaches to the way that you know data centers are being delivered, and there are some companies that are maybe pursuing some less traditional options. This would certainly be one of them. Uh, you know, and I think there's different. There certainly are pros and cons. You know, one of the one of the things I'll just say at the beginning of anything like this that is significantly different is, you know, most people with their data center IT infrastructure don't take like immediate gambles. You know, they want to see it work correctly over time before they will go, you know, potentially do something like this or use um, liquid immersion technology that, that will, you know, cool your your IT infrastructure differently than what is, is currently happening. So that's just, I think, an important part of it. That does not mean that this can't be successful or won't be successful. Um, but, you know, I think there's, you know, the pros are certainly the the reduction of, of the cost. I mean, there's some cost savings there. Um, you know, you, you can, you know, cool it with water differently and so more, more efficient. Um, you know, you can either, even, you know, cut your power, uh, you know, usage from just an efficiency perspective and get higher densities. So that's one of the things that we, we talked about yesterday with a couple of the groups that are, or one of the groups that's, that's focused on this. Um, but you know, it's, it's less traditional, um, and you know, it has to really fit in maybe your company's DNA and your, the, the portfolio approach, uh, you know, from a location standpoint. Um, but you know, there's some companies that are doing it and, you know, though, I'm sure there will be some more sophisticated companies that have it infrastructure that are willing to try something like this. You know, interestingly enough, the one that got a lot of attention this year, the Microsoft one that they had underwater, I think, for two years. Yes. And then they pulled it up and they yes. there was all the anyways, they were washing it off. That was actually not a floating data center. Yeah, which a, I think is different. It was a sunken data center. Yes, which I think is that I think they're this person, <laughs> It's the same concept though, right? Where they're using ambient cool water. Yeah. To cool I, their data center. Yeah, I would say that is probably a much bigger gamble than, you know, <laughs> than actually just having it float on there. But, you know, companies like Microsoft, you know, obviously have the capital and the teams to, to experiment with things like that and, and figure that out. And it's a fascinating, I mean, that's a fascinating approach and really interesting. Yeah. And if you look at like a decision making matrix, it seems like the need for higher density is going to be a larger function of the decision than the cost reduction. Yeah. Do you think, do you believe that is true? Yeah, I think so. Because if you're going to take that, that approach... Um, you know, you're you're trying to do some things that are different than you've done before, and many times it's not just from a capital perspective. There's different things going on. You know, you've got to make data center decisions based off of economics, like the money that you have and things like that. But it can't all be based on that. If that's all you base your decision on, there's going to be challenges down the road. There's, you know, philosophical approaches to the way people put their infrastructure online and things like that. Mm. So. Yeah, one of the companies we talked to, you know, they said that it's it is certain companies that need 30, 40, 50, 75 kW per rack. I'm really pushing it here. Uh, but th that yeah, kind of dovetails into the next question. We got asked about, hey, how are rack densities? You know, we hear that they're increasing. 
uh, how is that changing development and sales? And you know, if you put a megawatt in 10,000 square feet versus 5,000 square feet, like how is that? You know, is that a major disruptive force in the industry today? Mike, let me tell you a story. Oh gosh, it's story time with David. I cannot wait. <laughs> uh, like five years ago, like I've walked through a lot of data centers. You know, understatement. Okay, sure, but whatever. Uh, and I'd say like five, seven years ago, you'd walk through and, and data center operators would talk about the densities they could achieve. And and if you ask the question, okay, how many customers are actually doing, let's say, 10 kW a rack or 50, you know, he's like, well, you know, we're still working with customers to get to that because to, the, to my point earlier, it's like a philosophical uh, discussion on, you know, how you architect your applications and where they go, et cetera. So, uh, now, uh, you know, I can think very specifically to a year ago, I was in Northern Virginia, I was walking through a, it's like a 72 megawatt co-location data center facility, and you could hear, you know, when you walk by a, an area where uh, the densities are higher, I mean, you can hear it. And so now you don't even have to ask anymore if you're walking through a data center, you can actually sometimes hear where those things are happening. So there's certainly that transition happening today. And I think that it will continue to happen over time. Although most enterprise users, you know, traditionally are between like four, you know, three to five KW per cabinet. Uh, but that will change over time. So we're going to see that happen. And, you know, I think the, the important thing to remember is that this is a power game. It's not a space game. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, your point, you can put as much power into space as long as you can cool it. Cooling becomes the problem. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about people, you know, people say, well, hey, what if you can put, you know, more power into less space? How's it change things? It's like, well, people are paying for the ability to use the power, you know, and so that's the approach that, you know, all these leases that are built on, it's built on power, not on space. So, um, but I, you know, rack densities will increase over time. Yes, but do you see that being a, you know, a rapid, will there be like a period of inflection, a point of inflection where, you know, there's like a rapid uptick in density, or do you feel like that's going to happen slowly over time? Uh, it's just gradual. I mean, this is the most like sophisticated companies will get there, but and you can get there faster. But there's some companies that are like they just make these decisions every like five, ten years. You know, so yeah. it's like it's not going to all of a sudden. You know, next year everybody's going to be at 15 kW per per cabinet. Yeah. All but right, that's a good question. Thank you that is a for that question. question. Yes. Uh, Back in October, Microsoft announced the build of three cloud data centers in Athens, Greece. Any comments on that? Uh, the, I would just say that this example uh, points to the fact that, you know, large companies are looking to get mature in, you know, primary and secondary markets, which, you know, certainly would consider Greece a, a secondary data center market. But companies, you know, that have that are serving the business needs and like personal needs of users all over the world are going, Hey, we, we have to have infrastructure in place to do that. And I think that's what this shows. Um, you know, the other thing I would say is every area is, has different regulations to like to, to be able to build and deploy infrastructure over time and all that stuff. And so, um, you know, sometimes the regulatory environment in Europe, uh, it, it obviously is different than it is in the U S and different than it is in Asia. And so I think a lot of these companies are trying to get as, mature as they can in these markets. And, and that you want to talk about a trend in 2021, watch that. That is that, that's what I would yeah. say points to, I to think that I trend. I literally just read yesterday that they had established a footprint in Denmark as well. So sure. again, it's happening, yep. it's coming. Uh, and we're going to be there to see it happen. Yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, shameless plug. We're covering secondary markets in Europe. All right. By the way, do you know, this is the question, quote, by the way, do you know how many IT people usually work on site at a data center? And this is a great question because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing. Um, well, I would say not as many as you think. And, you know, the the scale of the data center uh, developments has grown over time. Um, but, you know, this is oftentimes one of the biggest challenges that people have with new developments coming into a market is like, how many jobs is it going to bring? Mm -hmm. And typically, the majority of those jobs, if you're in this space, you know this, but the majority of those jobs come at the beginning of this process when you're, you have all of your labor that is needed to actually build a, a, a 300,000 square foot facility that's going to have, you know, 36 megawatts and do X, Y, and Z all that labor's up front, but then to actually run the data centers to typically a smaller group, you know, 20 to 30 individuals uh, can do that. Now, these are high paying jobs uh, and these facilities and the amount of money they bring in bring significant value to the tax 
um, you know, the tax roles that are in this, these markets. Uh, but it's typically a, a smaller, a smaller group, but a very important group because it's, you know, keeping the infrastructure up for, you know, companies and people to use all over the world. Yeah. And I think, again, the, through the pandemic, I do think, you know, the way the data center operators operated is it did change. And, and if you companies, I think some companies invested or had already some automation processes in place yep. to, you know, again, this, it sounds bad to say, but to really reduce the headcount. Yeah, you had to, I mean, because, you know, you really wanted to limit how many yes. people were in data. And so th I think those things will persist yeah, over absolutely. time and those automation trends will continue. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is not what some people want to hear, but they would prefer to have as few people as possible in the data center yeah. from a security standpoint, from a risk standpoint, from a global pandemic standpoint. Yeah. So I think we'll see that, again, automation continue and probably, you know, fewer people can be physically on site. Yeah. Okay, next question. Next question. It really starts with a statement, and I think you specifically want to hear this. It says, I really love your content. Man, Two exclamation more points. More of that. That person is going to be at the top of the list. Yep. That's actually it. That's, there's nothing beyond that. I just <laughs> wanted to read that here. No, I was kidding. It says, I, and then followed up, I have a question. Thank Good. you for letting us know. What is the advantage of doing business with a smaller data center, like under 5 megawatts, than a larger player, than a 20 to 100 megawatts? Oh, so how are question. How can smaller data centers attract big customers in order to grow? I have a list of about probably five people who I think submitted this question. But there you go. We'll go. Well, I so you know a couple of things. I mean, one is, um, you know, there's these different companies have different you know value propositions, and they're going to serve um, you know users in different ways. So I would say if you're a, a smaller data center operator, you know your um, value prop is around you know really being able to serve the customer's needs well. You know, you're not maybe one of a thousand customers at this facility. Maybe you're one of a hundred or, you know, it's a smaller group potentially. Um, and then I, the other thing I would say is, you know, typically smaller data center users have uh, more needs because they don't have teams internally that do their network. They don't have teams that focus on their, you know, firewall prevention, you know, whatever those things are. And so, you know, as a smaller data center operator, you can offer additional services that can help some of these companies that potentially would need, um, you know, need additional help. The other thing I would say is, you know, the, to your comment on like edge deployments and being able to serve people maybe in markets that um, are smaller, you know, having a regional footprint in certain areas is going to be really valuable as demand gets spread out over time. So, um, you know, I think those are the things that I would be focused on if I was trying to attract, you know, companies at that smaller, you know, smaller data center footprint, um, you know, level. The other thing is to have, you know, uh, certifications that might focus on one industry. It might be healthcare or financial or, you know, you might look to get like federally, um, uh, your Certified, certification, yeah. yeah, so that you can, you know, attract different clients from that perspective. So those type of things really make a difference. And, and if you're a smaller data center operator, that expertise, that can be really valuable. Okay. All right, so last question here is, it says, what is the breakdown between the public and private companies with respect to leasing? Yeah, you know, depending on, like every time period is a bit different, but, um, you know, it's probably half and half. And there's reasons that, you know, companies want to be with a big, global player and companies want to be maybe with a smaller data center operator, smaller in the sense maybe of their portfolio, not necessarily of the size that they can do. I mean, one of the things that I would say is this has gotten extremely competitive over the last three to five years. And, you know, even the offerings themselves, while there's not, you know, uh, there's certainly differentiation with maybe how they approach some of the granularities behind cooling or, you know, th those type of things at, at, you know, the high level. I mean, they're providing the infrastructure for these companies to put their gear in and keep it on and keep it running uh, efficiently and effectively over a time period. So, um, you know, but we really haven't seen like, oh, you know, privately owned companies are getting all of the, the leasing, you know, going on. I think that the takeaway is that those, r those privately owned companies are very um, smart uh, they have a lot of industry experience and they've, they've been very successful. And so when you have that dynamic going on, um, it creates a competitive market and, and, and that's only going to get more competitive. Yeah. I mean, and again, I don't know that there's that much difference in the data center industry than there would be in other industries when you have private companies competing with public companies and that there's just different financial realities for both of those companies sure. that may or may not have 
a significant impact on how they run their yeah. business. So I think, you know, you would say the the product offering or even the service offering between a public and private companies, by and large, very similar. Yeah. Would you, would you agree with that? Sure. And, 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 and there's going to be some people that are like talking in their cars if they're listening, like, oh, you know, you don't know our cool leaders sure. and again, whatever. I think, and I get it. But there are some yeah, differences. Is, but at a high level, it is to provide the infrastructure so that those companies can. Yeah, almost, in, you know, there, I would say at the feels like at the top end of the market, like all these companies have cash, you know, they're it, it's it's can they bring the business in that would enable them to go do the development, et cetera. Yeah. But, but you know, for a I would say like a middle sized company, like a mid tier company. Yeah, there may be there may be cash flow issues which could be impacted by public private. Yeah. I True mean, story. I mean, do you agree sure. with that? How you get your. Yeah. I mean, you know, having available capital to go and transact on businesses if you don't have it or if you have problems having it in any, in any industry, but especially this one, you're in trouble. And I'm going to tease back to another podcast we oh, recently put it. out about 2021 predictions that investor interest in the space will continue. There you go. So we expect that if you need money, you can get some. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if i go that far, but it does, there is a lot of investor interest in this sure. space. So you hopefully bet. if you need money, they have money. Yes. Phone call. Make it happen. Okay, so this was our Q&A from our listeners. Again, if you have a question you'd like us to answer, you can comment below. Uh, we'll do our very best to work it into a future podcast. Uh, again, also LinkedIn, other social. Uh, we're constantly looking at those to see if people are commenting there. And uh, we'd love to re be responsive to your feedback. So again, love that you're engaging with us. Again, please subscribe to this channel, like the video. Uh, it should enable us to get our, continue to get our message out and, uh, and track the industry going forward.